Well, hey, good morning and welcome to church, everybody. Uh, if you're new here, my name's Chad and I'm one of the pastors here. And this is the point in service where I always say, if you have a Bible, grab it. Um, and if you don't have a Bible, that's okay. You'll see one in the pews in front of you. And we'll be on page 852 in those Bibles. Uh, for the rest of us, that's Mark chapter 15. So why don't you turn there? And while you're doing that, let me ask you a question. If you were writing a biography of your life, or I guess that'd be an autobiography, uh, what would the main story be? What would the moment be that really captures the essence of uh, who you are and what your life is about and what makes you unique and worth writing a biography about? Um, I was thinking about this question for me this week. I don't know that I'm unique or worth writing a biography about, but... um, And I'm also a work in progress, so the stories could change, right? Um, But I was thinking about it this week, and for me, right now, it might be the story of when I first asked Karen out on a date. Um, Some of you are like, oh, no, it's not a cute story. She said no. (laughs) Uh, Some of you are like, that explains some things. Um, If if you were to ask Karen, she would tell you the reason she said no is because I basically asked her to marry me, and she hardly knew me. Um, That's not how I recall it. And since I have the mic right now, here's how I recall it. Um, What I recall is um, seeing this beautiful woman at church who uh, loved Jesus and was very type A, like maybe more so than me. And I was starting to pick up through some interactions that she might be strong enough uh, to stand up to my nonsense. And so I was really excited. So um, I came and I asked her out and I guess I came on a little strong. I I, I don't know. I don't intend being strong, but but that's me. And... um, Here's what I'd say. I got the last laugh on that one, though, right? <laughs> so she said no. Less than six months later, we're, at, we're married. If you have questions about that, if you want to strategize, I don't know that I've got a strategy for you, but I'll share the story. Persistence sometimes beats resistance if God's at work. So um, that said, oh gosh, that could be horrible advice if you just apply that super broadly. Um, uh, see a pastor, see a friend. Make sure you're doing that in a godly way. Anyway, uh, <laughs> um, today we've come to Jesus' story. Um, The story that kind of captures Jesus' life, and uh, it's the story of Jesus' crucifixion. Um, Now, for you, that might not be the favorite story you think of when you think of Jesus, um, but we're in Mark's gospel, and this is his entire biography of Jesus' life has been leading to this moment. He's been dropping us breadcrumbs, preparing this from page one onward, that this is the moment that the whole book is leading up to. And it's not just Mark. It's uh, really, if you look throughout the New Testament, you'll see uh, Paul, a man who uh, followed Jesus and planted churches all over the Roman Empire uh, and wrote most of the New Testament, what he will say when he describes his great ministry secret is he says, I decided to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Um, For Paul and Mark and the authors of the New Testament, the crucifixion story of Jesus is the story um, that more than any other captures who he is and what makes him unique and what makes him worth writing a biography about. Like this is the essence of it, Jesus and his cross. And my hope is that um, by the end of this message today, you will not only understand why they thought this was the main story, Um, but that you might, like Mark and Paul and so many others before us, experience afresh um, the beauty of this story that they would put it at the center of their life and thinking and biography of Jesus. Are you ready? All right. Mark chapter 13. I'm going to read the, or excuse me, uh, 15, and I'm going to read the, the whole story. Here we go. Mark 15, starting in verse 1, says this. As soon as it was morning... The chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Now, at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they had asked. And among the rebels in prison who had been committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began asking Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. 
But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man that you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion and they clothed them in a purple cloak and twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on him. And they began to salute him, hail the king of the Jews. And they were striking his head with the reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we might see him and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthane, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. I I don't normally read our entire text at one time like that, but um, I've seen about this week. There's so many things that can be said about this story. And so I just want to give the Holy Spirit some space to let those words sit with us and ask that he would help us to hear this story right where we need it this morning. Um, Father, I feel insufficient uh, to preach this message. There's so much in the crucifixion of your son. And so I ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to um, uh, speak through me. And, and to give ears to us to hear that we might hear the main thing that you brought us here to hear this morning. Would you help us to see um, beauty in your crucified son? Would you help us to see more of your heart for us? In his beautiful name I ask. Amen. All right, we're going to look at this story in three parts this morning. We're going to talk about um, a tragic exchange we're going to talk about the humiliation of the cross, and then we'll talk about the power of the cross. Let's, let's start with the tragic exchange. Um, after taking Jesus to Pilate, um, or excuse me, after the, the trial we looked at last week, you remember that? Kind of a sham of a trial, total misjustice, totally illegal. After that whole awesome ordeal, uh, the religious leaders take Jesus to Pilate. Now, Pilate was the uh, Roman governor in the city of Jerusalem, and the reason they took Jesus to Pilate is because the religious leaders had certain power to um, provide certain sanctions. They could say Jesus couldn't enter the temple again, um, but they didn't have the power um, to kill anybody. 
At this point in history, uh, the people of Israel uh, were conquered, uh, and so the Holy Land was under the control of an up-and-coming nation you might have heard of, uh, the nation Rome. And so the Roman Empire is in control, and so the Jewish leaders, they go, we want to kill this guy, but we're not in charge anymore, so we've got to convince the Romans that he's a threat to them so that they will kill him as well. So the Jewish religious leaders, they take Jesus to Pilate and they say, man, this guy thinks he's a god. He thinks he's our ruler. He thinks he's a king. This guy's dangerous. You need to kill him. And Pilate, um, he sees right through this. Mark tells us he could tell that it was out of jealousy that the religious leaders offered Jesus up. And so Pilate goes, this whole thing is a joke. What are these guys doing? I can tell. And, and he, Mark also tells us he's amazed at the silence of Jesus, like we talked about last week. So something's going on in Pilate. And so he tries to get Jesus off the hook. He, he goes to the crowds in Jerusalem and he says, hey, look, around this time every year, it's Passover. We Romans, we like to show our benevolence by releasing one of your prisoners back to you. And so, um, you know, since it's Passover, do you want me to release Jesus to you if he's such a big deal? And, and this is the moment, you got to see it, this is the moment where the whole story could turn. Um, you got to remember, the religious leaders did this trial illegally at night under the cover of darkness because they were afraid that if they did it in the light of day, that the crowds would turn on them because Jesus was so popular with the crowds. I mean, five days earlier, they were singing his praises. The religious leaders feared what the crowds might say, so they tried to do this in the cover of night, but Pilate brings it out into the daylight. He says, hey guys, do you want me to release Jesus to you? This is the moment the whole story could turn. But something shocking happens. The crowd say, no, no, we don't want Jesus released to us Barabbas, this winner of a man. I mean, we don't know his whole story, but Mark tells us he was a murderer who was in jail for insurrection. So basically, this guy tried to overthrow the nation of Rome, and maybe you can see the appeal for these guys. Um, I know it's been a while since we were actually in the Palm Sunday story back in January, but maybe you'll remember... um, the people in Jerusalem were looking for a military Messiah. They defined salvation in terms of coming in and killing the Romans and giving the Holy Land back to the people of Israel. And so maybe you can understand where these guys are coming from. Because over the last five days, Jesus came in, they proclaimed him, Messiah, King, save us. But then over the last five days, he did anything but go after the Romans. In fact, he went after the religious place. He went to the temple and he flipped over tables and he says, your religious practice is full of injustice and needs to change. I ain't so concerned about the Romans as I am my own people. What is wrong? This has to change. And so the crowds, I mean, just trying to get into their skin a little bit here, it seems like they're saying, Um, you know what, Barabbas might be a messed up dude that killed a bunch of people, but at least he's willing to kill for the sake of getting Rome out of here. And so they say, we don't want this Jesus and his talk of justice and sin and repentance. We want the Romans out. So don't give us Jesus, give us Barabbas instead. And so just like that, the crowds that were singing his praises five days earlier join in with Jesus's enemies. They exchanged the Messiah for a murderer. Now, just reading the room right now, um, I know it's so easy to go, if only I were there. I mean, I wouldn't exchange the Messiah for a murderer. Um, But here's what I would say to you. Um, Yes, you would. Yes, you would have. And so would I, because we're still making this tragic exchange today. Um, Here's what I mean by this. Um, Karen's out of town right now. And so I wouldn't say that I've been bored. I would say that I've had some more time for deeper reflection. And as I've been doing that, um, here's what I'm realizing. I I just want to have some real talk with you. Um, I've been realizing um, that I've been making our marriage all about me lately. And my desires and my wants and my needs and my expectations of what I need when I get home at the end of the day is not chaos after chaos I need peace and quiet and calm. And so it's just been a lot about this guy here, me, myself, and I, the wrong trinity, if you will. Um, And I think it's led me to make impossible demands of Karen. And I I think, frankly, as I'm just reflecting and the Holy Spirit's helping me see my heart, it's like, I don't think I've been a lot of fun to be around lately. Um, 
And so that's why I'm not too judgy about these crowds, because what, what I've done is exchange Jesus and everything he taught marriage is supposed to be. You know, this dynamic relationship where we can learn more of his heart through self-sacrificial love that's focused on another person. I've traded Jesus and all of that for an Americanized vision of marriage that says, no, nah, marriage is about making you happy. It's all about you. You're special, you, yourself, and I. And so what I've done is I've traded Jesus and his vision for marriage for a very Americanized vision that really fits with me and my flesh. I've traded one for the other. And I'm telling you, I don't think I've been a lot of fun to be around. And I think I'm normally pretty fun to be around. And so this is why I'm not so judgy with this crowd. Because you think I haven't preached on marriage before? Some of you are like, we've heard you preach on it. That's inconsistent. This is real talk, folks. This is why I'm not too judgy with this crowd. And this is why I say, I don't think you should be either. If you're now judgy with the crowd and with me, I would just say, I dare you to ask a friend in your life that knows Jesus, hey, am I at all exchanging Jesus and what he represents for something else? You might be surprised at the answer. See, well, we all do this, and, and this is why the world's so messed up. I said earlier um, that I think that it's made me make impossible demands of Karen and be not fun to be around, because think about it. Jesus is our creator, so when we exchange Jesus and his way of doing things for our way or the way of the world or the way of some other human that we think is wiser than Jesus, what we are doing is we are not only joining in with Jesus' enemies that set ourselves up against Jesus and his kingdom, we are becoming the enemies of flourishing. Because he's the creator, he knows how life is made to work best, and so when we trade that out, we are saying we're enemies of flourishing. And that's why when we make this tragic exchange in our lives, it has deadly consequences, just like it did in this story. And I'm telling you, if you think you're different from the crowd, I dare you to ask the Lord, am I doing this in my life? And ask a trusted friend. I think until you can see yourself in this crowd, this story will have very little power for you. But for those who can humbly confess, yeah, I'd be crying out with the scoffers. There's good news for us here is good news for us in this story. But like I said, th this has deadly consequences. They cry out for Jesus' crucifixion. And um, so Pilate's now in a tricky position. Um, he can tell Jesus is innocent, but now he can tell, if I let Jesus off, I'm going to have a riot on my hands. And the last governor in Jerusalem actually got kicked out and maybe killed for having a riot because Caesar doesn't like disorder in his empire. And so Pilate's in a tricky position. I, I can let Jesus off, but then I'm going to have a riot on my hands, and I, and I can't do that. And so Pilate, in a moment of cowardice, chooses what is convenient for him at the sake of justice. He condemns a man that he knows is innocent to death. He gives the crowds what they want. He says, fine, fine. If you want him dead, dead Jesus you'll get. I want peace. If me killing Jesus will give you peace, we're going to kill him. And, and it's not just any form of death. It's death by crucifixion. So we've talked about the tragic exchange and the deadly effects of it. Let's now talk about the humiliation of crucifixion. Um, this is, I think, kind of hard for us to understand because we live 2,000 years after this moment. We live 2,000 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, where the cross, because of Jesus' crucifixion, has taken on a new meaning and really reshaped our world. Um, so, you know, the whole idea of the, the underdog dying for the sake of the people, that was never a popular idea in the world until Jesus did it. Back then, the cross had a very different meaning. The cross, it was, it was one of the Romans' favorite means of execution, um, and they, they loved it because it was so brutal. And I want to help you feel this a little bit so you can understand the story. Um, the Romans, they, they ruled over a massive empire that, that stretched from what we now know as Europe to East Asia to North Africa. So this is a massive empire. And the question was, how do you keep an empire this large under control? Because no one else in history had been able to do this. So anytime the empire got too big, it would split, it would fracture. And so the Romans came up with a solution. Crucifixion. Crucifixion was a death so humiliating, 
so terrifying. It, it was a death that it wasn't only designed to torture and kill those that would dare to rise up against the rule and authority of Rome, but to do it in such a way that was so humiliating that would discourage anyone who might have followed that leader from ever standing up against Rome. Listen to how one historian puts it. Uh, he writes this, No death was more excruciating, more contemptible than crucifixion. To be hung naked, long in agony, swelling with ugly, uh, I've got my quote there wrong, ugly, I think it's welts on shoulders and chest, helpless to beat away the clamorous birds, such a fate Roman intellectuals agreed was the worst imaginable. This in turn was what rendered it so suitable a punishment for slaves. Lacking such a sanction, the entire order of the city might fall apart. Luxury and splendor, such as Rome could boast, they were dependent in the final reckoning on keeping those who sustained it in their place. And now he's going to quote a Roman senator from this period in history saying, After all, we have slaves drawn from every corner of the world in households practicing strange customs and foreign cults and no cults at all. And it is only by means of terror that we can help to coerce such scum. See, this is what the Romans were going for when they crucified Jesus. They wanted not only to kill Jesus, but to terrify anyone that would dare follow in his wake. They wanted not only to take Jesus off the map, but to so show the foolishness and the weakness of Jesus that no one would dare to, I don't know, make a religion out of it. And the Romans were efficient at doing this. They were skilled at doing this. They had done this with countless people before this. And so they knew what they were doing. This is why when they put the, the sign over Jesus' head that says, King of the Jews... They're, they're mocking him. They're using irony. They're saying as he's nailed to the cross and has to lift up on the spikes just to breathe another breath, they're saying, look at this guy. He said he was a king. He can't even breathe. Look at this guy. He said he was going to save the world. Like, I don't even think he's going to make it past his next breath. They beat him before he even got on the cross, so much so that somebody had to carry his cross for him. Look at his broken body. Does that look like a strong man to you? Does that look like someone that you want to follow? This is humiliating. This was designed to snuff out the Jesus movement once and for all, just like they had snuffed out so many movements before this one. That was their intention. That's what crucifixion was in the first century, but it is not what happened on this day. Um, the cross, it had its intended effects at first. People walking by, Mark tells us, were wagging their fingers at him. Kind of a euphemism for just going, look at you. They, they mocked Jesus just like they always would around crucifixions. They saw a defeated, broken man on the cross. And so they walked by and said, yeah, man, you said you'd rebuild the temple. You can't even breathe. You're so helpless. You said you'd save others. You can't even save yourself. Some king you are. But what's interesting is Jesus doesn't fire back. Uh, in fact, Luke, in his account of this story, tells us that he prays for the forgiveness of his enemies as they are walking by and mocking him. And this whole thing, it goes on for hours. And pain and suffering, so unimaginable that it was reserved for the lowest of society, the worst of the worst. He is suffering. He is being mocked. And after the hours passed, he breathes his last and he dies a humiliating death hanging on a tree that he created. And in that moment, it looks like what the Romans had designed with crucifixion had worked. What the religious leaders had wanted in that fake trial worked. What Satan, all the way back in chapter 1, wanted to get God off the map, to take God while he's vulnerable in the flesh and kill him, they all thought it worked. But in the moment that Jesus breathes his last, we take another shocking turn in the story. We read this in verse 39. And when the centurion... 
That means captain of a hundred. So this is the guy who was leading the crucifixion ceremony. This is the guy who was in charge of all this. When the Roman centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he, this Roman guy, he said, surely this man was the son of God. Um, That verse right there is the absolute climax of Mark's gospel. Commentators will agree on this. This is the point where Mark's bringing the story to the top. Because um, if you can remember back, all the way back to last Easter, uh, which I know a year ago, some of you are like, I do not remember that sermon, Pastor. Okay, Um, when we started the Gospel of Mark, we saw in Mark 1, verse 1, Mark told us two things about Jesus in his opening statement and kind of the cover page. He said, Jesus is the Messiah. That means the one who will fix the world. And that Jesus is the son of God. So the way he's going to be able to fix the world is he's not just another wise human. He's actually God put on flesh, entered into human history to make this place new. And Mark tells us this in the opening on the cover page so that we'll know what to watch for. Because if you go through the story, um, it takes people a little while to figure it out. Um, And by the time you get to Mark chapter 8, the disciples, they at least figure out the first part. The disciples, um, Peter, chief among them, says, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You're the one who's going to fix the world. Um, But then, like, immediately after that, Peter demonstrates he has no idea what that actually means. Um, Peter gets called Satan. It's a whole thing. We've got sermons online. We all do it, too. Be compassionate toward Peter. But... From the moment they say, Jesus, you're the Messiah, it becomes very clear through story after story after story that these guys are spiritually blind to what Jesus is really going to do to save the world. They don't really have a holistic vision of salvation. They have a flawed vision of salvation. And on and on and on this goes until they abandon Jesus in his hour of need, as we've been looking at recently. And so it's not until the end of the book that anyone but the demons, ironically, recognizes the divine nature of Jesus. It is at the end of the story, or almost the end, where this Roman centurion, which I want you to appreciate that, the Romans were the bad guys. So think the political party you don't like, it was one of those. All right? If I were to tell you that someone in that party really just had a revelation about who Jesus really is, well, this far out, we'd be like, that's kind of heresy. Jesus already walked the earth. You don't get to reinvent Jesus. But put yourself in their shoes. The bad guy realized who Jesus was and always proclaimed to be before we figured it out. Like, how did this happen? Can you feel the weight of that a little bit? Like, what in the world? How did this Roman dummy figure out what our God in the flesh looks like? And and that's Mark's point. That's why it's the climax of his gospel. His point is that anyone, anyone, even a Roman soldier, when they look at Jesus' death on the cross, will see him as he truly is and fall down in worship. Anyone, no matter their background, no matter how unlikely. If you were in the first century talking about someone that was an unlikely convert, it'd be a Roman soldier who was um, participating in killing Christians at this time. And yet this guy, when he sees Jesus on the cross, he confesses who he really is. And so I want to I dig in a little bit on how specifically he saw Jesus die because it's, it's not until this soldier sees how Jesus dies in Mark's word that he confesses Jesus is the Christ. It's not enough that Jesus was on the cross. It was the whole picture. It was how he died. It was his last words. It was his last breath that finally opened this guy's eyes. And he's like, this is otherworldly. This is divine. And so so let's just just for a moment dig in a little bit more closely on how Jesus died so that we could look at that third thing, the power of the cross, and see it like this Roman soldier did. Jesus, as he is suffering, as he is bleeding, as he is dying on the cross, he cries out. I'm not going to say that in Aramaic again. I tried my best and powered through that. He says the translation is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
Now, this goes back to Jesus' prayer in the garden. Um, if, you, if you weren't here when we looked at that story, he prays and says, Father, I know we've planned this from before the foundation of the world, but if there's any other way, if there is any other way that we can save the world without me having to drink this cup, I want that. Would you take this cup from me? That was weeks ago for us now. You have to remember, that was hours ago for Jesus. And so hanging on the cross, Jesus realizes the answer to that prayer. And and maybe he kind of sensed it when the trial was going south, like, okay. But for sure, as he's dying on the cross, he realizes the answer to that prayer is that no, there's no other way for the world to be saved. This cup will not pass from him. And so in this moment, he's not only humiliated for all of the world to see, In this moment, the righteous and the just wrath of God for all of the sin of the world, it comes rushing down onto the shoulders of his son. And he cries out in agony because for the first time, not even in history, since even before time began, for the first time ever, the son experienced something other than divine love from the father. For the first time ever, I mean, you gotta, you got to realize that from before the foundations of the world, God is this community of love, of Father, Son, and Spirit of self-giving love. And yet on the cross, God the Son in the flesh takes on the wrath of God for the sin against of the world. And we've talked about this through this series, but it bears repeating that what happened on the cross is that Jesus bore the wrath that you and I deserve for all the ways that we have done that tragic exchange earlier, for all the ways that we have exchanged um, the glory of our creator for created things, for all the ways we have said, I know that you said that, God, but I'm going to do this, and as a result, we have brought evil and injustice into this world. On the cross, Jesus bears the wrath for that. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us why. Um, This is written by a follower of Jesus named Paul that I mentioned earlier. Uh, He really, uh, I think, internalized the truth of this story. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, um, God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, God's answer to our tragic exchange that's so broken and messed up his good world is to make an even greater exchange, to trade our sin for the righteousness of his son so that through having our sins forgiven, through having wrath removed from us, that we might become a new kind of people, that we might be recreated in the image of his son, who is righteousness so right and true that after drinking the full cup of God's wrath, he'll walk out of the tomb three days later victorious over Satan's sin and death, because not even death can defeat his righteousness. This is what Jesus is doing on the cross. He is not losing like it appears. He is winning. He is establishing his kingdom of love and justice and forgiveness and grace. And and see, without the cross, you can have a kingdom of love or justice. Without the cross, you can have a kingdom of uh, forgiveness or a world that is free of brokenness and evil. But you cannot have both at the same time. Because our world, it's filled with broken sinners like you and me. And so how's Jesus going to deliver on this promise of a kingdom that will wash over this world and be good news to the lowest and the dirty and the broken and the marginalized in society? How's he going to deliver on that promise he made in Mark chapter 1? Through the cross. Through becoming sin for us so that he could trade us his righteousness. And and that's the power of the cross. 
That by going into the depth of human darkness, Jesus conquers evil at its source so that he can say to you and to me, just like he did to Peter back in Mark chapter 1, follow me and I'll make you a new kind of human. I'll make you into a new kind of person that lives for justice and love and freedom and flourishing and not the kind of person who steals flourishing, who leads to injustice and evil and sin through your own idolatry. I, I know what you are. I love you anyway. I've taken that on to myself. And so follow me and I'll make you into a new kind of person. That sin that's in your life that you're struggling with, you don't worry about that. I've already taken care of that on the cross. You are forgiven, you are free, and you belong to a new kingdom. You are no longer a part of the kingdom of darkness. I purchased you for the kingdom of light. And look, I don't know how much of that the Roman soldier understood in that moment. If he's a Roman, it's very unlikely he would have known the Hebrew Bible and had the concepts of atonement, substitutionary atonement, forgiveness of sin, God's care for both love and justice. So maybe he didn't know any of that, but here's what Mark is showing us, that this Roman soldier, whatever he knew, he saw this man dying for his enemies. And he had seen a lot of crucifixions. He knew how these things were supposed to go, but when he looked at this man, Jesus Christ, dying for his enemies, he saw enough to know that something otherworldly was taking place on the cross. And again, this comes at the climax of Mark's gospel. So he can say, if this guy saw it, you can see it too. If you look to the cross, then even Jesus' enemies will see who he really is and fall down in worship. Because it's in the cross that we see most clearly who Jesus is. A God that brings about his kingdom through dying for his enemies. And, And that's the real power of the cross. And um, I'm going to make a bold statement, but I promise you it's true. Every problem in your life is a result of not seeing Jesus clearly. Every problem in your life, it is a result of not seeing Jesus clearly. And for the record, just to continue the real talk, every problem in my life is a result of me not seeing Jesus clearly. Look, look we, we are not so unlike the crowd who rejected Jesus and asked for Barabbas, or let's just call it what it is. We are not so like, unlike the crowd that rejects the Messiah and asks for a murderer because they they misunderstood the kingdom of God and what salvation and what life is really supposed to be. We're not so unlike this crowd. And look, so, so there's a lot of places you can go to see Jesus more clearly. And and that's really what we've been trying to do with this whole series. It's story after story after story that we might better get to know what Jesus is really like. That as Jesus feeds the 5,000, we could go, man, I don't even need to pack a lunch today. It's all going to be good. That as Jesus heals people that other people wouldn't even touch, we can go, wow, what compassion, what grace. As Jesus forgives sin, we could go, I don't have to pretend anymore. I I could bring my real self to God because he knows me as I am and will love me. Anyway, we've been trying to do this with this whole series, that the more and more we see Jesus, it would touch the problems and the pains of our life. But, But I'll tell you this, we are now in the climax of the story. And what Mark is showing us in his climax is the cross of Jesus Christ is where you and I will see Jesus most clearly. This is why, I don't know if you know if you've noticed this, we have connected every single story in this series ultimately to what happens on the cross. Some of you are like, I thought that's because you just had no other way to end the sermon. No, there's a reason for that. Um, there's a reason that Paul said, I decided to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. There's a reason that every time he opened his mouth, whatever topic he was going to talk on, whether it's relationships, finances, uh, work, whatever it is, friendships, he's going to ultimately talk about the cross of Jesus Christ because Paul knew what Mark knew, what I'm telling you I've experienced in my life, that the cross of Jesus Christ is where we will see our God most clearly. And so this is why every message you'll ever hear me preach to will eventually get to the cross. And I've been here long enough that kind of the newness is probably starting to wear off. I know that. 
If it ever feels repetitive that we're getting to the cross, let this be the why. Because the cross is where we see Jesus most clearly. And I'm telling you, when you look to the cross like this Roman soldier did, it has the power to change your life. That's why I want to tell you about the cross of Jesus every week. This isn't theory to me. This is something I have experienced and am experiencing. And I want us to be a community that experiences this as well. That There's a lot about Jesus to talk about. And in all of it, we want to get to the main thing where we can see him most clearly. And, and I want to try to be practical. I also want to land the plane. So let me just say this. Um, When you look to the cross like this Roman soldier did, it has the power to change your life. And and I mean that holistically. Just touch on the big categories right now. It has the power to change the shame that you feel. The longer and longer I do this, the more and more I realize that most people are walking around with this hidden sense of this thing that I've done, this thing that was said about me, this thing that was done to me. And most of our lives are a reaction out of this thing that we don't like about us. And what the cross does to that shame, when we see Jesus Christ up there, in the most shameful of moments imaginable, we could go, my God knows what it feels like to feel humiliated and unlovable. And yet my God isn't unlovable. In fact, he loved me so much that he went through that voluntarily for me, and his word over me is, daughter, son, you are clean. It's not like he doesn't know shame. He's been to the worst of the worst. And the declaration of Jesus from the cross is, it is finished. I've taken your shame from you, so you don't need to carry that anymore. When we see Jesus on the cross, it touches our areas of shame. It also touches our areas of struggle. Like for some of you, you're like, I I don't know why God hasn't answered this prayer yet. Or I don't know why God would ask this of me that he's very clearly asked of me. It does not seem good. It does not seem life-giving. I don't get it. I'm struggling. I want to follow Jesus, but I'm having a hard time. And what I would simply say to that is in church, we can so often should on ourselves and say, I should do this. I should do that. But I've got to tell you, it's never been hearing, here's the right thing to do. Go do it. That's changed me. The only thing that's ever touched or changed my struggles in a lasting way is seeing that in the midst of my struggle, while I was still God's enemy, Jesus Christ went to the cross, took on my sin, died in my place for my sin, and rose again to invite me into a new life. I'll tell you, as as the Holy Spirit's like revealing my selfishness to me, um, what frees me to say that to you and what um, compels me to be eager to pick Karen up from the airport is not knowing here's how I should be a better husband. It's seeing how Jesus has loved me. Like, that makes me want to do something new, even if it feels hard, even if it feels impossible. Like, Jesus is a God who went through what looks like death to bring us life. So do you think he might be worth trusting if the things he's asking of you feel like death? Do you really think that he's holding out on you? If he is willing to give up his life in this way for you, what do you think he's going to ever hold out on you? So I think it's got to touch our struggles and empower us to live new lives. And, and, and then the third thing I'll say is, because I'm Baptist, I've got to get a third one in there, is um, I think it touches on our pain. Um, I've seen a lot about this this week. What do you think Jesus felt on the cross? I mean, I didn't even go into the physical details of the scourging, of the physical agony he's in. And then there's the emotional agony of while he is dying for the sins of the world, being called weak and dumb. Jesus knew pain. He is not unacquainted with being sinned against, hurt. And so I I don't know your story, but Again, the longer I've been doing this, I know a lot of you walk in here this morning and you have pain. There are people in your life that have said unforgivable things to you that are not true and not fair. 
there are difficult circumstances in your life because we live in a broken world, things that have happened to you that just are not fair. And when you are lied about, when you are called names, when you are just trying to love other people, like Jesus here, the most natural thing, I think, is to either run or to fight back and to get revenge, like the disciples, exemplifying both. And what we see in Jesus here is another way to react. I I think our world has enough cowards like Pilate running from the fight and enough people seeking revenge like Peter cutting off the high priest's ear. I think the world has quite enough cowards and angry people. But what we see in the cross is something otherworldly, that in the face of hate and sin directed at us, that we could respond by sacrificing for our enemies. I wonder if the Holy Spirit maybe wants to help you see Jesus in your pain this morning. That He knows your pain. And that he's bought your entrance into a kingdom where the, the only response to pain is not just to fight back and get snarky and to get mean or to run. But there is a strength in our pain that as we see what Jesus did for us in the midst of his pain, it can begin to compel us into a new and life-giving response. This is what transformed the cross from being a humiliating symbol of Roman power and the weakness of the one crucified to a symbol of um, power for the weak and love for the unlovable and grace for the needy. It was the first Christians who really understood the message of the cross that Jesus' kingdom comes through dying for his enemies, that there's power and weakness when God is involved, that death and sin don't get the last words, that grace and love get the last words. Is the first Christians really internalized this message. This is what turned the Roman world upside down. This is why we think of crucifixion different 2,000 years later. Because a group of people experienced the reality of this message and it shaped their lives and they went everywhere and they told everybody about it. And look, I'm no fool. I know that if you read any study or survey today of what people think about Christians, you are not going to see at the top of the list love for the unlovely, justice for those being denied it, forgiveness and grace, strength through weakness. I'm no fool that the Christian church has fallen on hard times. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Don't read into my statement there. I think some of that's fair, some of that's unfair. But the reality is, I don't think most non-Christians look at the cross as sweetly as we do. And they didn't in Jesus' day either. And as the early church internalized this message, they turned the world upside down as they followed their crucified king into living cross-shaped lives that says the kingdom comes through sacrificial love for our enemies. And I think what an opportunity we have in our day where the cross is again being held in low esteem. If we could be a people that would with their eyes fixed on our crucified king, know the depth of the power of this cross, that we begin to live cross-shaped lives that bring life through death to this world. I think that's the opportunity we have. And so what I want to do is I want to pray for us and to ask that Jesus would get our eyes up like this Roman soldier this morning, that we might end our service singing his praises. Jesus... I feel like my words fail me right now, and so I ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to do what I cannot. Would you help us to get our eyes up to you, who for the joy set before you endured everything we've talked about, despising its shame, knowing that we could stand here today and hear of your love for us. Would you send your Holy Spirit to apply that where we need it, whether that's to shame, struggle, pain, or something totally unmentioned and then unlisted here? Would you help us to recover the revolutionary message of your death-defying love? Would you make it more real to us that we might walk out of this place more freed up in your love, more alive in you, more trusting in you to be good and gracious and forgiving, and as a result, more mirroring and imaging you in this world? 
Help us. In your beautiful name I ask. Amen.